Welcome back, everyone. My name is Miranda Levy, and I have epilepsy. I've been volunteering with the Epilepsy Foundation for about 10 or 11 years now. Our next speaker will be Dr. Howard Jeffries. Dr. Jeffries is a clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington. He also serves as medical director of clinical effectiveness at Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Jeffries will speak to the Affordable Health Care Act and its impact on epilepsy. Please welcome Dr. Jeffries. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, to speak today. Um, this is clearly a timely uh, topic, timely issue. There's been a lot that's gone on um, around the country and also locally within the last, I mean, sort of on a day-by-day -day basis. I mean, as I've been sort of preparing for this talk every day, it seems to change. Um, so hopefully I, I have it as, uh, at least as up-to-date as, as what's going on. I, I also appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to speak to this foundation when um, many years ago when I was a young medical student. Um, I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, was my first, uh, my first sort of really exposure was, uh, was working for the Epilepsy Foundation in Florida, so I grew up in Miami, and got to spend time at a camp in the Everglades um, with children with epilepsy. And it was, a, it was a, you know, I think it sort of crystallized that I wanted to move into pediatrics um, in my career and ended up uh, doing critical care medicine um, uh, for my fellowship. So I work as an ICU doctor um, at Seattle Children's, as well as my role in clinical effectiveness. Um, and eventually, towards the end of my talk, we'll talk about some of the work we're doing in clinical effectiveness, which uh, has direct impact um, on all patients at the hospital, but also specifically on kids who we see with epilepsy. So I want to talk about, so I'll go through four things, and I, I always like to give an agenda, so if you're bored, you know when we're, we're near the end, just keep that in mind. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, talk about uh, its impact uh, in general, but then also uh, what's happening locally, uh, both in our state and in our city. Um, talk about the impact on children, young adult, adults with epilepsy, and then what is Seattle Children's doing in response to the Affordable Care Act, and, and how are the changes that, that we, we, are, we see are happening. So, love it or hate it, you know, the Affordable Care Act is here, um, and it's law. Um, and I think we are seeing more and more its impact again, as we, as most people in the room know, the exchanges went live uh, October 1st, and I'll talk a bit about that, um, but it's here, and there are, um, I mean, I think the, the sweeping nature of it is really unprecedented. I mean, the more I've, more I've been reading about it, the deeper the law is and the, the breadth of the law is really quite remarkable. I think it's most likely the, the, mo the most uh, impactful and major change we've seen to healthcare since uh, Medicaid and Medicare in the 60s. I mean, it's really dramatic, and I think we're all going to feel the impact of it. So let's think about talk about where we are on the timeline. So the, this was signed into law in March of 2010, um, and so uh, since that time, um, there were changes in the first year. So coverage was expanded for specific populations. Um, there were high risk pools created. Those will actually uh, go out uh, or terminate in July of 2014, so they were sort of a, a bridge. Um, and dependents up to 26 were required to be kept on their parents' uh, plan. There are some limitations, I'll talk about that, uh, for people up to 26, and those are actually phasing out as well. Uh, we eliminated pre-existing conditions for children. Um, lifetime benefits at caps were removed. Preventative health care services were brought in. Um, and there were uh, pilots brought in for Medicaid as well. In the next two years, really, we're at the end of this period now, um, quality of care has been incented. So hospitals have been, um, uh, have been given the opportunity, for, at least for Medicare payments, to get paid more if they reduce preventable readmissions. If they hit specific targets for improving quality to patient outcomes, then they, they get paid more. So we're really trying to... It's been an attempt to try to move healthcare um, away from a, you know, where you get paid more if you do more, to more where you're seeing more value, where value is being rewarded. And we are seeing some demonstration projects, and I'll talk a little later about some of the work that we've tried at Seattle Children's, 
which is uh, in, in essentially a demonstration project. Um, there's been development of ACOs, accountable care organizations, which are an attempt to uh, get payment for value and to really manage whole patients. Again, not just looking at for hospitals and physicians to manage an episode of care, but really to try to manage the whole patient. Healthcare exchanges have been planned, and as we know, they went live, at least the sign-ups went live uh, a few weeks ago. So 2014 is going to bring pretty, pretty dramatic changes. I think as you read through the law, you know, 2014 is really the year where, where things change, where things come to pass. You know, a lot of stuff has been put in over the first three years, uh, but 14 is really a culmination. Um, and some of that has to do with uh, exchanges, and with exchanges have increased Medicaid eligibility. Um, some of the cost is being subsidized by the government. Again, not all of it, but some of it. Um, and there is further incentives for, for value uh, in, in the way that care is being paid for. So what happened uh, over this year? Well, some, some pretty major things. One, there were legal challenges to the Affordable Care Act. Um, these were upheld by uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, at least most provisions of it were upheld. Uh, increasing looking for value. So health organizations being paid for performance. And not just, as I said before, on fee for service. Um, there's been a lot of consolidation in the payment in the payer market. And I'll show some slides in a few minutes about what's been happening in Washington State. And I mean the changes we've seen over the last few years are dramatic. Um, and we haven't seen the type of consolidation um, before that we've seen that, uh, recently, uh, currently, that's going on in Washington State. Uh, there's been a, an increased focus on health informatics, the ability to share information um, across the healthcare system. Um, before, healthcare has been, you know, data has been fairly, much, fairly siloed, either in physician offices or in hospitals. The intent here is for data to really be, to be shared um, and to improve outcomes. And then um, the implementation of the exchanges um, have been a major change. So if we look through uh, what we expect from this, again, I think some of this is uncertain, um, and, and we don't really know. We don't know what's going to happen with employer-sponsored health insurance. I think there's been a lot of fear, or I don't know if fear is the right word, but a lot of discussion in the marketplace that, that this will erode employer insurance, that employers are going to say it's cheaper just for people to get their insurance products on the exchange. And we're not going to give them, and you know, they may, we may face some penalty, but that's okay. Uh, we'd rather have folks get on the exchanges cheaper for us in the long, in the long run. I think there, there's a feeling that's going to happen with small, in, small uh, companies, maybe mid-size, uncertain about large. I don't think we know the answer to that. I mean, that I think we'll, we'll know more in the next year or two as the exchange, the exchanges become more cemented and the products become more available. Uh, number two, consumers bearing more risk. Uh, I think this is something we've already seen, higher deductibles. And part of this is that people are starting to make choices not to go to places which cost more because they are being forced to pay more. Now, some of these are in high deductible health plans where employers are granting people some money for these plans, but at the end of the day, it's still money that people have a choice on where to spend it. And we expect that that will make some major differences, major, major changes in how people are selecting their health care. Uh, change in medical management systems. I think one of the, the concerns we have, and, and this is one of those things which is sort of a, a opposite to what we were, what I think the intent of the law is. The intent of the law with accountable care organizations is that people are look uh, that population management is attempted to come into play. And so what that means is that that care is meant to improve across the life of a person. But with the changes in insurance, people being able to freely move across the exchanges, there is some concern that the insurers may not, be, may not have the same motivation because they may not be able to look across the whole life of a person because people are moving from plan to plan. Uh, again, these are things we don't know, but these are risks that we need to pay attention to over the next few years. Uh, increasing use of risk-sharing models. Uh, and this is moving away from fee-for-service and toward value-based payment uh, for hospitals and um, physicians and other providers. And then changes in, in state budgets. Uh, with more uh, people coming onto Medicaid, uh, it's a little uncertain what that's going to happen to the state budgets and how much states are going to be able to pick up uh, this increase because some of the dollars are being reduced from the federal government and some are being increased again. And it sort of depends on a state by state basis uh, where that settles out. 
So, you know, this, this slide is a little busy, but what I'm intending to, to, to show here is, you know, where we are today is really on the, on your left of the slide, which is in the, in the fee-for-service world. Um, where care is really paid by, uh, or payment is really paid by how much um, care is being provided. You know, the, the, the move is really towards this capitation. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways that's what the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, um, is trying to get towards, where uh, for a certain amount of money, you know, hospitals and providers are meant to cover and really manage a patient, manage a person for their health, for their whole life. Um, so that's really what we're trying, that's really the intent of where we're getting towards. You know, I would say there are, there are parts of Washington State that are on, towards the right of this. A lot of folks are still on the left, and people are sort of trying to figure out how do we learn to do this um, so we actually start moving to the right where we feel we need to be. Um, and I'll show some examples later of in Seattle Children's of how we're trying to, to move away from a fee-for-service environment, which we've really been in for, well, for as long as uh, we've been collecting bills. <laughs> So I want to talk about some of the specific um, pieces of the, uh, uh, of the act. So this is looking at the impact on private insurance. So a lot of changes. Um, the, uh, and just as a, a sort of a glossary of terms to understand, so there's the concept of grandfathered. And a grandfathered plan is a plan that was in place before 2010. And grandfathered plans have different rules on them than new plans. Um, if you make changes to the plan, so you change el eligibility criteria, you change benefits, you're no longer grandfathered. Um, there are some very strict rules about when a plan becomes a new plan. And so some of that changes um, the law. Though in 2014, next year, a lot, of the, 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 um, uh, a lot of that sort of goes away because they're really trying to really paint a level playing field across all plans. So in 2010, what was implemented for all plans was that um, health coverage rescissions were eliminated. And what that means is a, hosp uh, a plan excuse me, cannot rescind coverage uh, based on uh, expenses paid for any medical condition. So that was put in in 2010. There were lifetime limits on essential benefits, and their extension of uh, dependent coverage to age 26. If you were less than 26 and you're on your parents' plan, you were guaranteed to stay on that. Um, the only caveat to that is if you then had a job that gave employer benefits, um, then you had to go on your employer benefit. So that was something that got put in in 2010. That actually is now going to be removed in 14. So for new and grandfathered group plans, but not for individual plans, again, some of this becomes very confusing as to you know, which plan is what and, and what happens. But for, for these, for most grandfathered group plans and new plans, uh, pre-existing conditions um, for children less than 19 were eliminated. Um, and also there was elimination on annual limits um, for essential benefits. We'll talk about what essential benefits are. That the yeah. definition of the essential benefits has really been left up to the states. So starting um, in this January, so for all plans, extension of dep uh, dependent coverage to 26 for all. So again, regardless of whether or not the person who's less than 26 gets a job, and there's a prohibition on excessively long waiting periods. So before, a plan could sort of get out of this by saying, okay, we're just going to make you wait for a year. Well, now the, 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 the longest they can make you wait is 90 days when you start a new job. So that's coming in in 14 as well. And so for um, new uh, group and individual plans, um, starting in January, there's a guaranteed issue of coverage. If you request coverage, you pay the premium, you're guaranteed to get it. So that's something new. That's coming out uh, next month or in two months. Uh, guarantee that coverage will be renewable, regardless of how much, uh, how, what are the benefits that are paid out. And with that, essentially, it's a discrimination against the, uh, a discrimination against beneficiaries based on their health status because of these guaranteed uh, issued and guaranteed renewability. And there's a requirement to provide essential health benefits. Again, I think there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate of what is an essential health benefit. Um, there are broad strokes which have been put out by the government. Uh, but again, the, the devil is in the details in those, and that remains to be seen what those are going to be. Um, the only uh, sort of wrinkle to this are these are self-insured plans. So self-insured plans, these new self-insured plans, um, do not have to guarantee uh, uh, coverage, do not have to guarantee renewability, um, and uh, um, they don't have the same requirements. 
Um, so there is, uh, I would say, they're the one area where um, we don't see the same sort of levels of protection. And in some ways, we're actually seeing more self-insured plans. So this is something we're going to have to pay attention to, um, to see how if this becomes a, a, a big issue. Again, if we look locally, we have self-insured plans with uh, big employers, Boeing, um, Amazon, um, Microsoft. So I have to see how the impact of that is. So there's a, uh, uh, if we look at uh, people who are on Medicare, so Part D of Medicare, which is supplemental uh, benefits for drug coverage, medication coverage, um, there's a thing called the donut hole, um, which I only learned about in reading about this because, you know, in pediatrics, we don't, we don't, we don't have donut holes. Um, <laughs> just whole donuts. Sorry. Um, and, and the donut hole is basically that there's a, 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 a limit where after you hit this limit, um, basically there's no more payments until you then hit a catastrophic number. So there's a $2,500 to $3,000 gap that doesn't get paid for. Um, the ACA is helping to close that gap. Um, we'd be bringing the ACA on, so that closed it to 50% of that is already been closed, and that's going to then transition over the next seven years to eventually close, but it's really a slow process uh, to get there. So let's talk about the exchanges. So the exchanges clearly have governed, have gotten lots of press, um, locally, nationally. Um, so the exchanges are marketplaces for individuals and small businesses uh, to comparison shop and purchase healthcare insurance. So it's where people can go and, and buy healthcare insurance. Uh, can I actually just get a show of hands? Has anybody been on the Washington State site? So a few folks. Yeah, I, 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 you know it's it's fairly easy to get through. Um, I'll show you some some of the things that I found as I was I was searching through it. Um, we haven't heard the same concern as been raised with a national national uh, uh, with a national exchange uh, website. So the intent of the exchanges is really to um, increase competition um, and choice. Um, and provide standard benefits at a low cost. Um, health plans on the exchange have to offer essential health benefits. Um, and they have to follow established limits on cost sharing. And so they have to limit the out-of-pocket expenses, they have to limit the deductibles, and they have to limit uh, costs for co-pays for insurance, for medications, as well as ED visits. And uh, enrollment just started, it's supposed to, and it's intended to go through March 31st, with care beginning in January. Um, so essentially, the exchanges again they allow people to enroll. What they what what a lot of the work or what some, a lot of the folks who are going on the exchanges we're seeing is actually they're being put into Medicaid because the Medicaid uh, levels uh, are increased to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. Um, that is actually moving a lot of people into Medicaid who go on to the the exchanges. That's what we're seeing actually in Washington State more than people buying individual coverage. We're seeing that transition um, onto Medicaid. Um, as you get on the exchanges, you're able to see if you receive uh, a subsidy. Uh, and so there are subsidies up to 400% uh, of federal poverty levels um, for, um, for individuals and families who are attempting to purchase uh, coverage on the exchange. Um, and again, the intent is also to limit out-of-pocket expenses. And the out-of-pocket expense limit for an individual um, is right now is 6350 and for a family, it's 12700 And this seems to change all the time. You know, I mean, you, as you sort of look into this, what was limits a year or two ago are different today. And so that's where the limits are now. And I, I don't know if that's where they're going to be in two months. So essential medical benefits. Um, so this list was uh, it's actually the list that was generated by uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Ambulatory patient services, ED services, hospitalization, maternity care, mental health, the treatment of substance abuse disorders, prescription drugs, rehabilitative and habilitative services. And I learned what habilitative means. And habilitative means uh, it's occupational therapy, it's speech therapy, it's neurodevelopmental um, therapy for children uh, up to age six, essentially for the most part. It's laboratory services, uh, preventive care. And then pediatric services, including oral and vision care. And as you see, that oral and vision care is actually one of those things for pediatric patients, which is carved out and actually is a requirement on all plans. So if we look uh, in Washington State or even around the country, 
you know, I've heard the term precious metal plants. So, I mean, all the plants have these, you know, you know, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. I have actually haven't seen any platinum plants. Um, so really there's three levels of plants. There's bronze, silver, and gold. And the intent of the, the, the level of these uh, metal levels is to let you know how, um, sort of how rich the benefits are. And with gold having more benefits um, than bronze, but the premium for gold is also more. However, the plan is intended to actually have to pay more as you go from bronze to gold for the care that's delivered. Um, again, there are premium tax credits, as I was saying. So for a family of uh, four, it's up to $94,000 they get, can get a premium. For an individual, it's up to $45,000. And those premiums um, get smaller as you get closer to the, um, to the limit. It's on a sliding scale. And there are also built into the plans cost-sharing subsidies. So for the out-of-pocket expenses, up to 250% of the federal poverty level, um, there are subsidies that are given to um, families and individuals. But one of the, I mean, one of the striking things I think we've seen here is is the shift of this of this bat of this battle, if you will, um, to the states. You know, this this red and blue divide, um, where the states that are Republican for the most part have not adopted their own exchanges, and they've left that up to the federal government. I mean, the federal government was not expecting this. You know, they 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 didn't know, they didn't think that they were going to have to manage, you know, almost 40 states' um, exchanges. And again, I think that's clearly what we've seen with the challenges with the, um, with the enrollment process uh, on the website. Uh, again, that's been well documented. So as you see on the, on the, on the, in the west uh, part of the United States, again, lots of exchanges. Um, lots of states have opted for exchanges a little bit in the northeast, but southeast, middle of the country, it's not really there. So a very fascinating um, a uh, few years, I think, to see actually what's going to happen with this. You know, are we going to see um, inequities in healthcare because of the exchanges that are run by the government versus the exchanges that are run by the states? I don't think we know the answer to that. Those are things we'll have to sort out. And um, I want to show you a picture um, that I, I saw. So this was from trick or treating the other night. Um, I thought it was at least appropriate. So this, if you can't really see well, but that's actually a skeleton trying to sign on. Um, there's a little computer in front of him for Obamacare. So, uh, it's hard to see, but there's a laptop on that desk. Um, so, I thought that was nice. Um, so what's happening in Washington? Well, when the exchanges went up uh, October 1st, uh, seven companies offered products. Uh, of these, uh, uh, um, again, the same type of thing. We. Uh, there are subsidies between 130 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, again, there's an, an expectation um, that many folks will be able to access to be enrolled in Medicaid who have not been enrolled in the past um, through the exchange uh, method. Um, and there's an expectation that by 2017, about 400,000 folks from Washington will enroll on the exchanges, about 60,000 of them um, being children. When um, the exchanges opened, uh, in Washington, so I went on this uh, on the website to try to just get a sense of what it was like. And what I what I found was that there were for for Seattle again, it's they're very they're different based on where you live in the state, and the premiums are different based on where you live in Washington State. I think they divided Washington up into five regions, and so I put in you know person who is 43 <laughs> years old, um, Seattleite, um, non-smoker, and so this is what came up. These were the cheapest plans. Um, in their in this precious metal color in in the in the bronze silver and gold categories coordinated care and again I'm not do, trying to do this as an advertisement for coordinated care they have a I think they made a decision that they're going to be the lowest product so they have the lowest price product um, for in, for every one of the individual um, uh, categories so the premium here was at two hundred dollars um, for uh, for a bronze product again the deductible is really high six thousand dollars. Um, and the out-of-pocket is, again, yeah, 6350 which is the highest they're allowed. You know, no cost for ED, no cost for primary care visits. As you move down, as you move to the different colors, um, silver and gold, you know, the premiums rise. Uh, and these are monthly premiums for an individual. Uh, the deductibles fall as well to something that, you know, is still is high, but not nearly as, as, as high as, that, as the bronze plan. Um, and then as you go through the uh, benefits, you know, they're pretty variable. Um, they, they range throughout. So when I talked before about the essential benefits, that list of 10 things, so the states 
decide how they're going to say what are essential benefits. So what Washington State did was they took um, a plan by Regents called ANOVA. And ANOVA is the largest plan that is uh, basically taken on by small businesses in the state. So they said, okay, that is going to be our standard. And so from that plan is where all the essential benefits come from. Now, I, I went on the ANOVA plan to try to understand it, and it's challenging because within that ANOVA plan, there are four different levels. And so within the four different levels, you don't know easily which one is they're picking for the essential benefits. You can see what is given, but you don't know what the coinsurance is because that changes based on the dollars. So I think a lot of this stuff is still meant we're still figuring out. Um, so I know it's a bit unsettling. If, we had, if this lecture was in two months, I might have a little more for you. Um, but again, this is something we're learning, again, day by day. So by 2017, so we're expecting in Washington State for uh, 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 almost 400,000 uh, folks to uh, enroll on the exchanges. So if we look on the left, um, the left is, is what, what, what the, where we are today uh, in 2013. Almost 4 million people in Washington State are covered by commercial, a million in Medicaid, 800,000 Medicare, and 780,000 are uninsured. Uh, by 2017, that uninsured number is intended to fall to 220,000, 227,000. Medicare is, this is envisioned to stay the same, but you see Medicaid increases quite a bit to 1.3. And on the exchange, um, the anticipation is about 400,000 folks will, will gain insurance uh, that way. Um, you know, and this uh, shows that, um, again, 3.8 million are actually going to be covered by commercial, uh, which is, you know, again, a, a little more than than we have today. So there are, again, some big changes that we're expecting to see. And I think one of the biggest things we're going to see is an increase in the Medicaid population, uh, people covered by Medicaid, and then we'll see the exchanges as well. It's uncertain um, what impact we're going to see on commercial. I think that's really going to depend on what the employers do. So just, uh, just for some statistics on Washington State Medicaid. So currently, today, 50% of deliveries and 46% of children in Washington children in Washington are covered by Medicaid. Again, so for children, for pediatric care, uh, Medicaid really has uh, the biggest say of anyone. And I, that's not going to change. Uh, I mean, I think you can see by the changes we're seeing in the, in the, on the last slide, that's just going to get more impactful, more prevalent over the next few years. Um, one of the changes, some of the changes we're seeing within Washington State Medicaid is we're going to see increased payments to providers. And this is increased payments to uh, primary care providers. This was a part of the ACA as well to encourage uh, a growth in, um, in a number of providers who manage uh, patients from primary care. Again, historically, primary care providers, pediatricians, family practitioners, internal medicine docs, um, and, um, and uh, nurse practitioners who are taking care of patients in primary care so they have not been paid very well. And so they're trying to see if we can increase the amount of people who go into that field by trying to make the rates uh, more equivalent to what we see in subspecialty practices. So pediatricians are, are paid a little better, so they're going to see an increase of 20%. But internists and in practitioners nurse who are seeing adults who have not been paid well, they're going to should see a 50% increase uh, in Medicaid payments. Again, the intent here, intent here is to try to get closer to, to Medicare rates. Uh, locally, um, the state is uh, intending to focus more on prevention, to have parity across mental health uh, payments. Um, and uh, Washington has received a $1 million planning grant from um, CMS. So as part of the Affordable Care Act was the development of the CMMI, which is the Center for Medicaid uh, and Medicare Services Innovation Center. And that Innovation Center has passed out grants uh, to many states around the country uh, to see if we can uh, improve care. And so that's looking at value-based purchasing, looking at increased preventative strategies um, for all people, and especially for early intervention for children, and trying to integrate care across the continuum. So what's happening locally? So at, at this point, payers don't seem to be getting into value-based purchasing. We're not, we're not seeing that yet. We're not seeing contracts for, for, for physicians or hospitals looking at value. It's still really on this fee-for-service basis. We're not yet um, seeing that. We are seeing a lot of uh, downward pressure on pricing. And we are seeing um, uh, uh, the insurers really starting to say, you know, what the prices are that other hospitals, that hospitals um, are, are being, uh, are, are charging. Again, the Seattle Children's was in the press this week. 
don't know if any of you saw it, but it was in um, the local section of the paper for two or three days in a row, talking about our prices of appendectomies versus non-children's hospitals. So again, the payers are getting very, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but they're becoming very um, vocal um, about the pricing and want to make sure pricing is consistent across hospitals. Um, we're seeing changes in employers. So narrow networks. So Boeing, for example, issued uh, a call to get um, an ACO form, an accountable care organization form. And uh, Microsoft has started a health savings account. Again, big changes in, in their historic way that they were, um, uh, they were paying for health care insurance. Um, and as I said, we are seeing rapid consolidation in Washington State in hospital and health systems. So here's just a picture of the, of the area that we're in. And if you look here, right now, Western Washington is consolidated into six systems. Swedish, Peace Health, Franciscan, UW, Multicare, um, and then up in Island. Again, if we looked at this map five years ago, there would have been about 20 different colors. And now we have six. And we're expecting these to continue to shrink. Again, the standalone hospitals are getting pretty nervous. Um, there are still some out there. But they're getting nervous about being alone, and they're feeling they need to, to aggregate into these systems um, to be able to survive. So I think we're going to see more of that in the next few years. So now if we, if we say, okay, how does this Affordable Care Act, what is the impact then on children with special health care needs, specifically um, children and young adults uh, who have epilepsy? So 15% of children in the U.S. have health care needs. So again, uh, special health care needs. So again, a very large group. Um, over 11 million people. And 3% of kids with special health care needs have epilepsy uh, in the United States, about 345,000. So if we look at their insurance types, so for children with epilepsy, uh, about a third of private insurance, about half of public insurance, and, and again, fortunately at this point, less than 1% are uninsured. But it doesn't tell the complete story because I think there is uninsurance and then there is insurance which is really not covering um, the bulk of the costs. And if we talk about adequacy of insurance, again, this is according to families. So for children with epilepsy, only 38% of families in the United States feel that the insurance is adequately covering the costs um, of health care. And with children with special health needs, it's a similar number. And families are paying more than $1,000 for out-of-pocket medical expenses, you know, almost 40% um, of uh, families who have children with epilepsy. So again, while families are covered by insurance, while well, children are being covered by insurance, uh, it's clearly inadequate and not meeting the needs, um, uh, that, that not, not meeting the needs. So then if we ask, are the conditions causing financial problems? Again, overwhelmingly, almost 50% are saying it is. So again, we're not, we're, not hit, we're not doing what we need to do in the United States. And, and I think the intent of the Affordable Care Act is to get closer. You know, I'm not sure we're going to get all the way there, but it, it hopefully is a step in the right direction. And the bottom piece is that, uh, you know, almost over half of families with children with epilepsy have felt the need to have family members to cut back or stop working. So the impacts are dramatic, I mean, as I'm sure many in the audience uh, are aware. And the intent of the Affordable Care Act is really to try to see if we can bridge some of that gap. And if we look at the Affordable Care Act, the provisions which, you know, seem to have the most impact um, is, are, uh, that depend, that youth that kids are on their parents' plan on page 26, and that coverage can't be rescinded based on the amount that is used. Again, that's clearly been an issue in the past, um, and that, I think, is a, a big step forward, along with that guaranteed issue and guaranteed renewal. So if you have a pre-existing condition, you're guaranteed to be able to get health care insurance. Um, these are, this has been, a, I think, one of the, the major changes to the law that I think is going to have the most benefits. Elimination of lifetime and annual benefit caps, and that uh, coverage cannot be denied for children less than 19 with a pre-existing condition. Again, I think these are some of the most important things um, in the law. And as I said, the law has you know, many, many pieces to it. Um, but I think these are most, uh, these seem to be the most impactful. So now if we talk a bit about uh, pediatrics in general. So pediatrics um, is at risk. Um, again, if you get halfway down the bullets, I mean, Medicare voters, you know, not to single them out, but they outnumber pediatric voters by 47 million to, to zero. Um, so, you know, that's a lot. And, 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 that's, and, and it's felt. 
I mean, again, I mean, most of us uh, in, in the room, uh, or most of us, a lot of us in the country have children, but we're, you know, the children aren't voting. Um, and so it makes a difference. Um, so pediatrics is a risk. Children are at risk because of cuts from the federal, uh, from the government, federal government, and state cuts. Um, and again, I think it's unclear what is going to happen um, on the healthcare exchanges. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I put this bullet together even before um, healthcare exchanges rolled out locally. And what we've seen locally, um, from at least from a Seattle children's point of view, is that of the, of the seven um, plans that came on with the exchange, again, only six of them were local. But of the six local plans, only two of them uh, covered Seattle children's uh, because we were too expensive when the exchange is open. Um, and in the paper, actually, this week now, it looks like a third, uh, Molina, uh, we have now, uh, Seattle Children's has a contract with. So, so three of the plans do not. You know, and that, I think, was one of the, that is the impetus that, um, uh, well, as part of that, Seattle Children sued the Office of the uh, Insurance Commissioner earlier this month. And the intent there is to say you cannot put plans out there which don't cover, you know, the basic needs of children who need subspecialty care. Uh, and so that, that is working through the system in, a, in, in an uh, attempt to um, give a counterpoint for Mara, who are one of the plans who did not came out with a paper on Wednesday, and they're the ones who then came out with pricing differences of children's hospitals versus um, non-children's hospitals. So I think that remains to be seen what happens in the laws and in and, and the courts and, and really, really does this impact care. I think at the end of the day, um, um, children's hospitals um, We'll take care of patients regardless of ability to pay, so it becomes less less of an issue. Um, but it will it has the potential to delay care. So I think those are things that we'll have to see over the next few weeks, months, years. Uh, so how are children's hospitals in general responding to this? Well, I, I think the main piece is trying to move towards accountable care. Um, some children's hospitals have bought health plans. Um, some are looking at risk contracting, where they're saying, pay us a lump of money and we will manage the life of children. So that is really moving towards an accountable care uh, framework. Um, and then there's the development of clinically integrated networks. A clinically integrated network is a way for uh, primary care providers and hospitals to align. So they start sharing data and sharing information and sharing the way that they're managing uh, people. And so they're starting to actually uh, look at managing people and managing patients um, in a very holistic uh, way. So at Seattle Children's, there are three things we're looking, really trying to understand how reimbursement is shifting. We want to align with uh, pediatricians and family doctors and nurse practitioners in the community, and we want to work closer with payers, even though we did sue a few of them. <laughs> so, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so if we look uh, nationally, um, you know, there, there's definitely, uh, we definitely believe uh, there needs to be a focus on uh, children with special health care needs. Um, you know, uh, these children have chronic lifelong problems. Um, in Medicaid, there are uh, almost 2 million or more uh, children, again, that's across the country. And it has, they comprise about 6% of the Medicaid population, but about 40% um, of the Medicaid uh, cost. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, motion nationally among children's hospitals um, to try to make sure that um, health care is guaranteed um, for these children. Um, because managing, uh, taking care of these kids is complicated. Um, they have many uh, acute chronic problems. There's not, not very many of them have a medical home where really they're looking at the, the whole care of, the, of these children. Uh, multiple providers, poorly coordinated care, and as you can imagine with all of that, there's high costs associated with it. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we believe that um, with, with strong care coordination and with clinical standard work, and, and standard work, I'll talk a bit, more uh, in a few slides, but it's really about practicing in a very standard, evidence-based way. We believe that can reduce costs uh, and also improve outcomes. Again, there's been a, a lot of experience in care management. Um, these are just some studies, but what they all say is that if you manage the care of a patient, if you can manage the care of a child, um, you can improve their life, you can improve the quality of their life, and you can do it at a reduced cost, uh, which is really what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to improving value, and value is looking at outcomes, looking at quality, divided by sort of over the cost it takes. 
We want to provide the most quality care that we can, not at the cheapest price, but at a cost that makes sense. Again, so the intent here is not to just drive cost out of the system, but is to utilize our resources appropriately and effectively to get um, the most we can out of them. Because we know that the, the, the resources are limited, um, and we need to do whatever we can uh, to provide the best care. So as part of this, um, about, 18, about 18 months to two years ago, um, Seattle Children's put together um, a program, was putting together a program to take care of their uh, most uh, complex kid, uh, children. Again, at this point, it was looking at a, an outpatient clinic, which would have a care coordination team. Uh, the children would have individualized care plans, and we would standardize the care for uh, these children. We would review their uh, medications uh, for effectiveness, and if they were on redundant medications. Um, but it was pretty expensive. When we looked at it, it was going to be about $600,000 a year. And we went to the payers and we said, it's expensive, but we are going to see benefits. And they said, we don't want to play. And so we said, well, we're going to need to do it ourselves. And one of the reasons they said they want to do it is there's no evidence to support that this makes a difference. And so, again, there is clearly evidence, but what we decided to do was actually do a trial. And so as this trial, we looked at parent reported quality and outcomes and cost and utilization outcomes for uh, our most complex children to see if with this methanol, with this program, um, could we have benefits. So yeah, we had some really interesting uh, findings. So six months uh, into the study, uh, compared to the control group, so parents who were, who were, were getting this, uh, were in the program, um, felt that they were getting the needed information. Um, I felt they were getting help with coordinating providers. Um, and among the primary care providers, um, they felt that um, uh, they had better relationships with the hospital, better relationships with us, but they were having uh, cha more challenges with families. Um, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So 12 months into the study, uh, the health care ratings by parents significantly improved over to the controls. Uh, and the parents were reporting that they were receiving the care they needed. Um, but the, the pediatricians uh, were having a hard time. Um, the family practitioner doctor having a hard time. And, and again, I, I, I think it's, it's a good thing. Um, the families that were getting the care were more, um, were asking for more from their pediatricians. You know, they were empowered that this is what they were receiving at the hospital and they were learning more and they were asking more of their doctors. And so we've been working with the pediatricians and family practitioners to help understand that you know, this is the program, this is what we want to have happen. We want care to really be distributed between uh, pediatricians in the community and the specialists in the hospital. We want to share and work together closer. Um, so I think we've, see, we've, we've achieved some of those goals. Again, that's work that we, we continue to be working on. And so 18 months into the study, uh, we found a 50% decrease in emergency department utilization. So again, we were seeing, uh, I think, improvements in, at least from the reported, from families reporting that their, the, their children seem better and they're happier with what's going on. And then we're also seeing less use of the emergency department as well. Um, but there are challenges in building this model. Again, it, it's, it's expensive. The care coordination infrastructure um, was expensive. Uh, we need care coordinators. There's IT and for informatics needs. Um, and we needed to develop the network. Uh, it was hard to actually track uh, where people were. And some of the interventions had limited evidence, but you know, felt that we felt we wanted to try them. Um, and so it was hard to really come up with a way to, to make this uh, sustainable, because again, the payers at this point still um, were not interested in working with us on this. Right around this time, as we actually had some experience with this, the, the healthcare authority who runs um, the Washington State Medicaid said, okay, we, we see what you're doing, we want you to see, can you come up with a care model um, for patients who are on SSI? And so SSI are the patients under Medicaid who are the most complex and have the highest, um, highest use of medical services. And so we came up with a plan to uh, develop shared care plans, um, to standardize care, to look at medication management. We were still trying to figure out what the right payment model is. It would be fee for service or some sort of uh, monthly payment to, um, from Medicaid for this. Again, that's something we were still grappling with. So we came up with an extensive model um, that we would divide our area into four regions and have care coordination across, across these regions to, uh, to help with this uh, program. So when we looked at the cost, again, the Medicaid wanted us to do this, but you know, they also wanted to see there were some cost savings associated with it at the same time that we were uh, improving 
quality. And so as we, we looked at some actuarial data, we tried to understand it. So from if we looked at three years out with no intervention versus three years out with intervention, we, we believe that we could uh, reduce inpatient utilization and the hospital length of stay. Bless you. And that we believe we could decrease uh, prescription uh, drug costs, again, through review of, of medications. Um, so we thought there could be about a 10% reduction. Well, so that 10% savings would be about $3 million for this patient, but the cost of the, ma of the program was $1.5 million. So again, almost 50% of any savings was, was basically what it cost to run the program. So Medicaid was a little leery about this. Um, so as part of that, we, the, the, I said before that the, there was these innovation grants. So we put in an innovation grant with the government uh, a year or two ago, and, but we didn't get it. Um, and the main reason they said we don't, you can't get it is because actually we weren't working with the payers. Um, so, you know, we sort of had this cycle where we wanted to work and they didn't want to work with us. The government said you need to work with them to get the grant. Um, well, over the last um, few months, um, we've been working closely with them. Um, and we actually have submitted another grant with the payers um, to do this very same thing. And our expectation actually is that, we, well, we're hoping to get the grant, but our expectation that even if we don't get the grant, now that we have the payers in line, aligned, this is something we're going to be rolling out over the next uh, year or so. So again, it's for again our response to say how can we improve value, um, and how can we really get to a point where we are providing the care that we feel we need to for our patients. So so from this, you know, we learned that it's really expensive, um, but that the the quality and the improvement in the care is really vital. And so this is something we need to do, and it's something that we plan on doing. Um, but one key aspect of this is the bottom bullet around clinical standard work. And so the only way that this works is by standardizing care. And so now I want to talk a bit about that. So that is some work that we've been working at on the hospital for the last two years. Um, and it's, really, it's been around to try to, to make care standard and consistent um, for any patient who's seen in the hospital. And the basis for this you know, comes from work that we've seen out of patients with cancer. So if you look at the outcomes of kids with cancer over the last 60 years, survival rates have risen dramatically. So before 1950, if you had leukemia, which is ALL, you, uh, you died within three months. And there was no hope. Um, in 1980, 50% of kids survived. Now, over 90% survived. And so how did they do this? Well, I mean, more than any other specialty, uh, the, the, the doctors who take care of kids with cancer are rigorously standard. They, they're on protocols, and they measure, and they monitor every little thing. And so they made dramatic improvements. And so at the hospital, we said, how can we do that across the hospital to really improve care? And as part of that, we developed what we call clinical standard work. And clinical standard work has three pieces. One is that we have a documented approach to standardizing diagnosis, management, and treatment, and that we look at evidence to help us. And the, the challenge in pediatric care is there's not that much evidence. Um, so when there's not evidence, then as a group, we say, this is how we're going to practice. Um, we hardwire care. We make it easy to perform care the same way. And a lot of that is actually using our electronic uh, health record on the hospital. We try to standardize care across that. And that we measure outcomes. We actually make sure that we are improving care. Because our goal, if we look at the bottom part of this graph, the goal is to get from a current state where you know, the care that you receive is based on, on who you see a lot of times. And it's not based on what you have and what the disease is that a patient has. And that's really what we want to get to. You know, that's our goal. That's our vision. That the care is similar depending on what the patient has and not what the provider you're seeing, um, what their biases are. And so with that, we anticipate we'll have appropriate resource utilization that will improve uh, both quality and safety. And this uh, has been um, um, cemented in a strategic plan goal for the hospital. So our goal by 2016, we started this in 2012, is to have half of our patients on a standard pathway um, in that five-year period. So right now, we're about 35%. So and that, this is as of last month. And so again, we're on the path. We're not there, but we're, we're definitely, we're, we're, we're happy at least that we're getting closer. We use standard pathway, standard algorithms. So if you look at our, if you look at our hospital internet, you actually even look on our extranet on seattlechildrens.org. If you type in clinical standard work or clinical standard pathways, you can see all the pathways. And they all look like this. Um, and so the intent is to have a standard way that we're managing patients the same way, and people know where to look at. I actually just got uh, an email from 
um, one of our people in marketing communications that are in, on our intranet, these pathways are the number top 10 sites that looked at. So we're, we're definitely making an impact that people are looking at these every day because this is now the way that we're taking care of kids. And so as part of that, we do track metrics. So this is looking at uh, kids who have jaundice. So if you, if you present with neonatal jaundice, we put you under lights, but we want to make sure that with this changes, we actually change the lights and we change the way we measure the light strength. We actually did get kids out of the hospital uh, faster. We actually reduced the amount of kids that were coming in from the emergency department as well. And we didn't have them, and kids were not bouncing back. We also looked for kids who come in with urinary tract infections. And so if you have a urinary tract infection, you needed to get a special radiologic test uh, called a VCUG, which is a uh, strong x-ray, basically, which we realized you didn't, you know, a lot of times we don't need. Uh, and so we've been seeing that we reduce the rates of that. And the bottom graph is actually getting kids on the correct antibiotic. Um, people were using these third or second, third, fourth generation antibiotics when you really just needed um, Keflex. We looked at it and said, if you have this, over 95% of the things get treated appropriately. And so we're moving people onto these pathways, onto these medications, which provide the best quality, but again, at a at a way that we're, we're doing it in a, in a logical fashion. So when we looked how we're doing in clinical standard work, we found that if you were managed in a standard fashion, it was uh, 2,000 less per for your hospital cost. Again, the intent when we put these pathways together wasn't to reduce cost. The intent was just to standardize care. But when you standardize care, you find that you take costs out of the system. So kids are staying in the hospital less, almost a half day less. And the most interesting thing we found is actually when we did assessments of the quality of life that the parents perceived they actually improved if they were managed in a standard fashion. And so this is work that we are uh, continuing to look at. And so how, have we, uh, 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 how are we tackling this? And you know, I try to uh, think about you know, how have we done, what has this work impacted on kids with epilepsy? This, this is a young girl um, who has epilepsy. And, uh, um, and I think her story um, is, is important for the work we've been doing. When she was admitted to the hospital a few months ago, um, before we had our standard work in place, um, she had a seizure on the floor, which was uh, predictable, because we knew that this is what happens to her, and you know, her mother told us this is what she does. Um, but it took us 103 minutes to get her, her, basically she needed three doses of medication. It took us over 100 minutes to get to that third dose of medication. And so she was seizing that entire time on the floor. Um, and so that, that's, that was not acceptable. Um, and so we said, we need to change the way that we're managing kids. And so we developed a pathway that, again, was to improve the quality of care for kids who have acute seizures. And we wanted to have easily accessible orders. And we wanted to have a rescue plan. And so, again, it was, it was if you knew kids who were, coming in with a, who were coming in because of a seizure disorder, we could get them on the pathway. The challenge was for kids who were coming in for other things. You know, how could we manage their seizures, even though that wasn't the primary reason they were coming into the hospital? Uh, and that became a lot of the work of this group. And so they developed a standard way um, of managing uh, kids. Um, again, we had a first-line agent and a second-line agent. They looked and they changed the way that things were being documented. So this is how the nurses were documenting, and so this got changed. Again, the way that we were able to get this work standard is by putting it into our electronic systems, into making it just the way that we manage patients on a daily basis. Again, so our unique challenge here was that we needed to have a rescue plan. But the, the, the trick here was that we had this rescue plan in there, but very few kids would actually need it. But we still wanted it to be there um, for every child. And it was, you know, again, like anything new, it's hard to get it um, uh, uh, done all the time. And so as part of that, we developed triggers. So anytime a physician would get into our order system, if there's a patient who has a seizure disorder, epilepsy who is not on a seizure pathway, they get a trigger. It comes up right in their face and they say, this patient should, be, should have a rescue plan ordered. And so with that, we've seen our compliance. This is the number of patients who actually have the order sets. has gone up to almost 75, 80%. So again, we're not at 100%, but we're definitely better than where we started in the 40s. And so this is work that we continue to do because we want patients to have, we want kids to have this available to them. And so this is what we found. So this, the, this uh, young girl who I told you about, who took 100 minutes to get her second line of medication. Once we put the pathway in place, we had another child come through. It took 24 minutes. So again, that's really what we were trying to do. So again, 
with some small changes in standardization, are able to improve care dramatically. So this is work that we continue to do and continue to uh, improve upon and try to make better um, on a daily basis now. So just to summarize, um, I'll just try to wrap this up. So the, uh, I think the Affordable Care Act you know, is a step uh, in the right direction. Uh, it's not all the way there. Um, there's still work that needs to be done to guarantee um, that, that uh, people are receiving the care they need. Um, and I think there's some great examples locally, also around the country, of innovative ways that people are working to improve quality and to improve value of health care. And, and I, I'm optimistic that we're going we're gonna to get better over the next few years. I think there will definitely be some ups and downs. Um, but I think we're, we're on the right path. At least, at least I'm optimistic we're on the right path. Well, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.